Chapter 1 The Turk laughs. Above the canyon, he watches the valley below. He takes the form of man and stands tall and erect. He knows his purpose. He waits for them to arrive. At noon, the men appear. Two monks in the moor move like slugs through the scorched desert sands. The wind pierces their faces amongst the swirling dirt. They trek five miles through the ungodly heat. The men ride on mules. The moor walks on foot. They are here to seek the cities, the cities of gold, God's forgotten gift, the promised ecstasy the Cabeza de Vaca had claimed long ago. And the Turk watches their every move. Days die. Days repeat. The land changes many times. They see mountains east, and they slope along the valleys north. Yet the desert follows them. And as the monks and moor pass through the valley and look ahead to the canyons, they feel with all conviction that they are finally within reach of their glory. But the desert denies them. The three pray. They question and cry. They see visions that they cannot explain. Much is forgotten. They lose direction. They lose sense of time and space. And for long periods, they cannot tell if they're dreaming. The sky collapses and turns red. Then black. Clouds approach and darken the horizon. Lightning strikes and clasps of thunder rumble on through yonder. A horrifying figure approaches. The figure is big and bold, and he laughs above the rolling thunder and dances amongst its shadows. They call him the Turk. And the three look at him in horror. He stands in front of all three. Then he raises his hands to the sky. The Turk glares at the three and waves two fingers. The monks stand back and quiver, but the moor approaches. A golden light appears, and the Turk points, and the moor follows. The monks shout out his name. Esteban! Esteban, don't! But the moor does not hear. Instead, he hears voices of eternity and voices of a city in the sands. The winds swirl. The moon returns and sheds its light. And Esteban races like a two-legged reptile, bouncing to and fro and lunging forward. He turns in all directions. His eyes shine bright like a child's, and sweat pours from his brow. His stride grows. He paces himself further and further away. The monks scream again. They shout, but they do not move. And the Turk looks back into the light and sees Esteban float down beyond the void. Esteban falls in vision and peers down to his kingdom below. From the glow, a golden city emerges. Its walls stretch on for hundreds of miles. Its roads are paved in streaks of solid gold, and the waterfall to its entrance pours an endless stream of rubies and silver. As the bond touches each golden wall, his eyes feast on the golden statues and the golden altar, the seven golden cities, the land of the promised, the land that he saw before so long ago with Cabeza de Vaca. It all returns. Then Esteban sees the city's people. He watches them climb down their ladders, and he yells in jubilation. Drums blare. A procession begins. Then a throng of people gather and parade Esteban down the golden streets, welcoming their king back home. Dust descends, and afterward Esteban finds a magnificent feast assembled on a long table. He sits at the helm and dines with his people, eating swine and apricots. He tells lewd jokes that make little sense, and his people laugh and cheer and toast. He drinks gallons of wine and seeks out the women he fancies most. And all is lost in splendor.
the Turk laughs, and all things disappear. And as Esteban turns to his side, he shouts in horror. The moon rises. The light dims. The monks stay silent. They shiver in fear. The Turk stares at them both. The young monk stands still, but the old monk slowly approaches the Turk. The young monk screams. Fray Marcos, no, don't go! It's El Diablo! Marcos lunges forward. His gaze locks onto the Turk. Marcos stammers and falls into a deep trance. The young monk screams louder. Fray Marcos, don't listen to him! Come back! But Marcos does not hear him. Church bells strike. Snakes scurry in the sand. The sky explodes with lightning. No thunder follows. And the Turk laughs again. Marcos walks further. He stares at the Turk's scorned and withered face, his ancient eyes and yellow teeth. The Turk glares, then looks up to the sky and vanishes. The light appears again, and Marcos cries. A brief but eternal moment falls upon him. Marcos sees the cities, just as Esteban, all of them in whole, the bright cities of lore. Marcos speaks in tongues. He points and babbles and turns to the young monk. Luis! Luis, don't you see it? Luis does not. The light disappears. The cities vanish. In nomine Patre et Fili et Spirito. The Turk reappears. He stands on the narrow strips of rock and cacti. Then he reaches to his side and reveals a golden cross the size of his chest. The Turk staggers until he is close enough. He places the cross into Marco's trembling hands and stares for the final time. Then the Turk levitates and escapes to the clouds. Fray Marcos, cries Luis. Marco shivers in the pouring rain, and Luis races towards him. They hold each other. They pray and cry. And again, Marcos' entire body shakes. In his hands rests the golden cross, the proof, which is now undeniable. They rush back through the rain, back west to Compostela, back to Coronado and the Viceroy, back to tell the whole world. The night passes. The empty land returns silent. Dawn breaks. In the canyon, the Turk walks towards the cacti and carries a corpse, the mauled and melted corpse of Esteban. Flies and locusts embed into his eyes. The Turk heaves the corpse and watches it fall down the gorge. Soon vultures gather and encircle. They swoop down, squawk, and feed off from it, red globs at a time. They peck and swallow. And the Turk watches and smiles. Another minute passed. It might have been more. I don't remember. The only thing I remembered for sure was that I was still in Coronado's den, that I finished telling him my tale of Peru, and that we were both very drunk. We stared into oblivion. We pitied each other. Who pitied more, I couldn't say, but the feeling was mutual. Coronado's face remained plump and red. He looked very much like that little boy I had known back in Salamanca. He rose his head and stared at the fire. And once again, I saw hunger and envy in his eyes. And I knew my story of Peru only whetted his appetite. In time, we asked our questions, and we answered them back as honestly as two madmen could. But still, his story remained untold. So what's your story, Coronado? I said. My story, he said. My story cannot begin yet. His face winced. His mouth hung open. <laughs> 
He tapped his head with his fingertips and coughed. It took him time to recover. Then Coronado told the tale. But it wasn't his tale. It was Cabeza de Vaca's tale. It was a story that I had heard many times, and frankly, I was sick of it. From the second I stood foot in Mexico, all I heard were incredible stories of men in the desert who had found grand cities of gold. This time, it was seven cities. It was all hearsay. There wasn't a shred of evidence, but I knew Coronado believed the story, as did many others. So I sat and pretended to be fascinated. He was very much in love and enthralled by the mystery, and I knew he believed it with all his heart. He reinforced the absurdity, word for word. But still, he looked very sad, and he exhaled and sighed. We have sent for the Moor and Fray Marcos. The monk is there to confirm the rumors. They've been gone for three months. A monk and a Moor. That's all I have, Sardina. My story begins when they return. My fortune lies in that desert. Until they return, here I wait. Here all the men of Galatia wait and starve. He ran his fingers through his hair. It took him a whole minute to say another word. Right now I have nothing, Sardina. I cannot have nothing. What about Cortez? What about him? Certainly he knows about these rumors. Certainly he could help. Coronado banged his fist against the table and threw his knife across the room. I don't want him to, shouted Coronado. I don't need him. He wanted to scream more but he restrained himself and regained his composure. Then he shrugged his shoulders and rolled his eyes as if he had heard a bad joke that he did not understand. I hope that bastard rots in the desert for all I care. Don't even mention his name to me again, Sardina. I won't, sir. Once our expedition concludes, I will make Cortez look like a fucking beggar. I promise you that. Then Coronado handed me a medium sack. I opened it and glanced inside. There were thirty pieces of gold. It's called a bribe, Sardina. I suggest you take it. We need you. I said nothing. I looked into his eyes. They looked frantic and ashamed. Yes, I know it should be more. You deserve much more, Sardina. You're one of the best men I've ever met. After what you've been through, I'll promise you'll get it. These cities, they're to the east. We have to strike now, before the others do. I stared at the map long and hard. It didn't make the least sense. The coordinates and symbols floated and danced and swirled. Mountains and hills. Valleys and plains. But mainly, desert. One city at a time, Sardina. Then Coronado slapped his knees and shook his head low to the ground. I didn't know the reason. In truth, I didn't want to know. I couldn't tell for sure, but I thought he was crying. Then he drank what was left of the bottle and threw it to the floor. I've waited my whole life for this, he said. I will put up my entire fortune to find these cities. Call me a fool but I'll be a rich fucking fool. You will too, Sardina. He stood up and extended his hand. Good night, Signor Sardina. Then Coronado shook my hand and left the den. The air felt cold. The stars looked dead. Again, I stood alone with my thoughts. As the night went on, I repeated two words to myself. Those two words haunted my entire life. They said so much about so many things and people. I heard those two words time and time again, not just in Spain, but also Peru, and now here in Mexico. But for that moment, it seemed as if those two words had been two lost friends. But they stayed in my company longer than I wanted them to. Coronado knew I was like any other man. <laughs> 
He knew I could be bought, and he knew he had me by the balls. And because he knew these things, he gave me the heaviest burden one could bear. He gave me a choice, a hellish choice, just like the serpent in Eden, just like Pizarro on the beach. And while I closed my eyes, Coronado's impossible question returned. Do you miss the chaos, Sardina? I told him I couldn't tell. But the truth was, I did. I did miss it. I miss the chase. I miss the story. I saw it all in that little pouch. And it reminded me of all I had lost in Peru. Desire. The want. The feeling of gold in my hands. And once again, it awoke everything in me. Then I shook my head and repeated those words once more. That bastard. During the night, I slept, but I did not dream. I saw black and violet strips of clouds, and I drifted for countless hours. I awoke in the morning to the sound of church bells. Their pitched chimes rang for nearly half an hour. I felt ambivalent and terribly empty, and for many moments, I thought I was dead, witnessing my own funeral. But I wasn't. I was still alive. I was not in Spain. I was not in Peru. I was in Mexico. I was in New Galicia. A horrible sight indeed. I found a half-filled bottle of wine and drank what was left of it. And for an hour, I wandered through the town in a daze. First, I listened to its sleepy sounds. I listened to the chirps from crickets and chickens, the squawks from old people muttering to themselves, and the loud shouts and pleas from the vendors selling fruits and quilts. All of these sounds made me cringe. For a town so dead and sad, it was hard to believe that Mexico City was only 50 miles away. I passed the edge of the town and stopped near a thick brush of rose bushes. Then a great silence followed me. I pricked my finger along the thorns just to stay awake, and I looked at the town from a distance. As morning mass ended, I saw the monks and seminarians gather, and I heard them chant and bellow. The church and square center were covered in hanging gardens with wild brambles that sloped and dipped across groves of flowering pears and palmettos. The land was hilly, the sands were red, tan, and heavy, and a dozen pueblos stood on either side. On the opposite side east, tents made from sheepskin scattered about carriages and stables. I stared at the residents and studied their faces. They looked pathetic in every sense of the word, and they smiled contently. They lived as if there were no other place on earth. They lived as if they perversely enjoyed living in their own comfortable hell. The men were investors, traders, and carpenters, and the women were old, married, and unattainable. There were about a dozen men who were of my age or younger, but each of them looked compromised. Even the children looked old. I tried to rationalize and ponder such a life. I thought of what they thought of me, the stranger who wandered about their town. What was his story? Was he of royalty? Or was he just a madman, chasing his so-called dream? Did he come here just to die, just like all the rest? I couldn't answer their questions. I never visited Old Galatia or Old Compostela. They were too far away, and my father said there was nothing to see there anyway. I envisioned them, though, from the stories that I heard from people and passers-by. I remained ignorant of their history. They might have been grand for all I knew. I knew not of their great battles or miracles. I just knew of their names. I knew of their masons and their wine. I thought one day I'd see them in the flesh. But New Galatia had none of these things. It had no history. None whatsoever. It was still too new. And if there were ever a place to die of boredom, New Galatia was as good as any. I looked back and examined how I got here. 
For one thing, it was my only option. When I boarded that boat and left for Peru, I never knew I would remain so poor. The day I arrived in New Galatia, I was poorer than I was when Francisco made his line in the sand in Panama. I was poorer than my father, who was quite possibly the poorest man of all Spain. But just a year before, I was one of the richest men of all the world, and my fortune was all contained in that little bag I had left in Peru, that little bag I had left in the jungle. Had I searched for it, I certainly knew I would die, just like all the other men did. It didn't mean anything to Manco. He scoffed at it. But still, he let me live. And I guess that was my bargain. All I had left now was my body and the guilt of my past that I knew would never leave me. But as I reached into my pocket, I found that small sack of gold that Coronado gave me the night prior. I held each piece. It still had power over me. It still shone. It still meant the world. But unlike Pizarro, Coronado gave me the gift of time to think it over. So I headed for the coast. I walked five miles south and reached the dock. I was surprised to see there were plenty of cargo ships passing in and out, but there were no transport ships of any kind. I talked to the men who carried the loads. Most of them were stowaways and slaves. They told me that the next transport ship was scheduled for departure in two weeks. I had asked what the average fare had cost. To my dismay, they said the fare increased 20%. Even with Coronado's gold, I had barely enough. And after the price of the fare, I would have exactly three pieces of gold left. Knowing this, I paced back and forth and asked the foreman if he had any short-time positions available. He politely declined. The next day, I walked about the dock, spending most of my time in between the two miles of surf and dune. While I waited, I ran into inquisitive drunks who asked me common questions. And I lied the best I could. Then a man approached me and tapped me on the shoulder. I know you from somewhere, said the man. Do you? I said to him. Yes, said the man. Your face looks familiar. Are you of Cortez's men? No. Then you are with the Pizarros. I was with neither. Then who are you? I wish I knew myself, I said. During the night, I stayed near the docks and slept on a lump of sheepskin. I awoke many times and found rats chewing at my boots. In the morning, I thought it was best to cleanse myself. It had been too long so I took to the bay and drenched my entire body in the cold water. I sunk my head and looked back at my reflection. I hardly recognized it. My face looked burnt and sad. I thought of the two weeks that I had to wait before the ship arrived. It might as well have been two years. It might as well have been two lifetimes. But if it did come, and I did charter it, I knew I'd never see this land again. Then I stared again at the vast ocean, thinking I'd find the answer. The tide came in and pulled me along with it, but all I saw was death. I clutched my stomach. The more I stared at the waves, the worse I felt. My eyes spun, and I vomited out the wine through my mouth and nose. The water was covered in blood and phlegm and for a brief moment, I felt a tremendous clarity. It lasted a full, long minute. But when it was over, I felt an emptiness that I knew too well. So I headed back to Galicia. There wasn't much else I could do. The morning bells rang, and I searched for Coronado. When I arrived at the stables, I eavesdropped at the murmurings of the town. For the entire morning and well into the afternoon, I searched the entire town for Coronado. I asked several people, but no one seemed to know where he was. Near the chapel, I saw the priest. They marched with Bibles and rosary beads, clutched in their sweaty hands. I looked inside the chapel 
It was dim and dank, and only a dozen candles were lit. I went down the aisle and looked from side to side. The pews were empty, and rats scurried in the darkness. I went back to Coronado's house. In the garden, I spotted his wife Beatrice and her two daughters. I stopped and watched them. They paid no attention to my entrance. They were dressed in white gowns, and they chased each other around a thick brush of blackberries. I heard them giggle and sing. I walked closer about ten paces and forced myself to smile. The girls continued to sing, and their mother joined the chorus. Martinio, Martinio, donde esta, donde esta? I walked further. My smile wore away. The song continued. Toca la campana, toca la campana, ding dong dong, ding dong. Then all three caught my eye. They stood frightened. I smiled again to break the fear. It seemed not to matter. Then I approached Beatrice, dropped to one knee, stood back up, and bowed. I tried not to look at her eyes, but I did. She was beautiful. There were no other words to describe her. And I stammered through my words. They came out jumbled, hasty, and pathetic. Pardon, pardon my dear lady, but do you know Master Coronado? Where is he? She looked at me strangely. She looked right through me. She gave me neither pity or concern. Your name, sir? Sardina. Oh, yes, yeah, Sardina. I remember you meeting my husband a few nights ago. My husband is quite fond of you. Her voice was flat, nasally, and dismissive. Her daughters clutched onto her legs. I bowed again. May I talk to your husband? You may, but he's not here right now. Where is he? He's probably out in the desert. The desert? What could he be doing there? Staring. Staring? That's all he ever does nowadays. She pointed east beyond the dunes and squalls of mesquite trees. He's been staring at that desert for five months. I tried to join him one day, but I'm afraid I don't find it as enjoyable as he does. I find it quite boring. She sighed and played with her daughter's hair. He isn't far, a mile or two. You'll find him there. Thank you, my lady. I bowed. I wanted to talk more, but I knew it would be in vain. I gave no further parting words. Neither did she. I bowed again and departed. I walked towards the bush and the outskirts of town. Then I turned east and reached the sands. But the sun still hung in the sky, and the beams of white light blinded me as I staggered forward. I didn't see a thing, except the vast, white, endless sands and the empty sky above. Then I found a slew of skulls scattered about the cacti. The skulls were of antelopes and abandoned steers. And that's where I found him. Coronado sat mounted on his white stallion. His silver armor glistened and blinded. And, like his wife said, he was staring. He gazed into the desert. He gazed into the void. He was waiting for his miracle. He was waiting for Marcos. I drew close to him, nodded, and kept my distance. He turned to me and smiled. And right up until dusk, we stared into the emptiness in the desert before us. We sweated and gazed again. I felt as if we were the two Marys beside the tomb. But Coronado's patience proved to be better than mine. He continued to stare at the mesquite trees and shrubs and the sand and stone and the cacti and scorpions. I listened to the yips and whimpers of the coyotes that came in staccatos. Then I turned my gaze back to Coronado. I couldn't tell what he was thinking. In truth, I didn't want to know. His voice sounded brittle. His face still young, filled with conviction. He was confidence in appearance alone. But inside, I could tell he was suffering. 
I'm glad you're still here, Sardina. Marco should arrive at any time, he said. How do you know, sir? I said. He didn't respond. Then he said a statement that he thought was profound. But the more I thought about it, the more I knew it was the dumbest thing I had ever heard in my life. Patience is the master plan, Sardina, he said. I didn't respond. To sit and wait and hope. That was his plan. It was beyond absurd. It was antithetical to everything I understood in my past. Patience? Patience in what? Patience for what? An hour went by. Coronado continued to gaze east. He stared again to the mesas. In the silence, I heard the muffled sounds of laughter. Perhaps it was Satan. Perhaps it was someone else. An hour went by. Then Viceroy Mendoza finally arrived. He was angry, fat, and dressed in royal garb. He got off his horse, staggered with a lean, kicked the dirt, and welcomed us with shouts. So where is that bastard monk? said Viceroy Mendoza. Damn fool, we've wasted enough time. Patience, Viceroy, said Coronado. There's a fine line between the patient and the absurd, but I'm not saying who's who. Mendoza jeered some more. How long have you two been out here? Since morning, I said. All my life, said Coronado. In both cases, it's entirely too long, the viceroy snapped. Life's too short to live like fools. He's somewhere, Viceroy, Coronado said. Somewhere. I'd rather Marcos be dead than somewhere. Mendoza spat, then looked around. He looked to his horse and retrieved the golden nugget from his saddle. You remember this, Francisco? He tossed the chunk of gold rock up into the air. Coronado caught it with both of his hands. Good. Look closer. Feel it. Remember why we came here. I'll give them three more days. If they do not return by then, consider the expedition cancelled indefinitely. The viceroy climbed back upon his horse and gave me a dirty stare. Then he spat on the ground and departed. The next day arrived and I studied the birds. They were cardinals and sparrows, red tails and desert finches. I watched them fly and peck at each other. They scratched and clenched and bled and swerved in constant need. And in the white and purple light of the sunrise, I found Coronado still at the very same spot he was yesterday. Yet still, there was no sign of Marcos. Another day followed, then another. But Coronado continued to stare at the desert. I joined him periodically, but I could only last an hour. We stared into the void, but every time, the void gave nothing in exchange. It remained dull and empty. Three more days had passed. No signs. No scouts. Whatever patience remained had completely vanquished. There was only the desert. The empty and hard desert. I simply couldn't bear another day. Only a dead man could wait as long as Coronado did. I figured I'd wait one more day before I returned to the docks. I figured it was all I could do. The night before, I planned out my future and made my decision. I would return to Spain, even poorer than my dear father. As the night ended, I looked into the dark violets of the sky and I thought of what to say to Coronado. In my mind, I practiced shaking his hand and saying my last goodbye. I knew he would understand, or at least pretend to. Either way, I was convinced the next morning would be my last day in New Galicia, and I felt all the more empty. And then it came. I heard footsteps along the stones in the water well. Then I heard shrieks, cries, and shouts. As I headed back, the sounds grew louder. Then I heard more cries from the alley. But by then, the whole world changed. Horses raced through the street. A crowd gathered, and the whole town exploded in cries of joy. 
I looked at their faces as they jumped up and down. Their eyes glistened. They looked stunned and overjoyed. They finally seemed alive. Wine spilled. Roses were thrown. And the whole of New Galatia swarmed and screamed. For another minute, the madness continued. And all I heard were shouts and cries and tears and shrieks. He's here! He's finally here! Fray Marcos is here! In Marcos's hand lay the golden cross. It was a foot long and ten inches thick. He's found it! He's found the cities! Where? Where? He says there's seven of them. Seven what? Cities of gold! So it is true! It's true! My God, it is! Cebola! Cebola! The friar has found them! He's found them! More and more people piled onto Marcos. He trembled and fell to the ground. Cuts and bruises scattered his bald head, and dirt and ash covered his wrinkled face. His robes were ragged and smelled of shit, and most of his teeth were gone. His eyes looked frightened, like a newborn seeing light for the very first time. And as I looked at him and stared into his eyes, I knew he had seen the impossible. At day's end, the entire town was drunk. Marcos had been ushered into Coronado's house, and I followed him. As I walked back to the stable, I saw Coronado standing by his Arabian stallion, and he greeted me once again with a grand smile. It's been arranged, Sardina, he said. Meet me in the Viceroy's quarter by nightfall. You'll be our third witness. In the evening, I entered the room. I saw four men. Rather, I saw their faces. The first two were Coronado and the Viceroy. The other two men I did not know. Coronado stood up from his chair, welcomed me, shook my hand, then offered me a glass of wine. I sipped at the chalice slowly. Then I addressed all the men, bowed, and took my seat. We stared at the door and waited for Marcos. Marcos arrived a half hour late. Along with him were Brother Luis and two appointed scribes. Both monks sat down, and the scribes prepared the quills and papers. With a cordial smile, Coronado nodded, and the deposition began. Coronado presented the opening remarks. He read a paragraph of officious jargon, which simply stated that all said was to be recorded and presented in full to the Majesties, Viceroys, and members of the Royal Court in Spain for further examination, and that Marcos was to give his testimony under oath. After the remarks, the Viceroy signaled to the scribes, and then he turned to Marcos. Speak clearly, Fray Marcos. Tell us all what you saw. Tell us all you remember. Marcos drew heavy breaths. He talked with a very high-pitched squeal. He was short, and his mouth quivered as he spoke. His head seemed swelled and pale, and he reminded me of a beached whale. He talked convincingly with his hands above his head, and his eyes never seemed to blink. Forgive me, forgive me all, Marcos began. I'm very tired at the moment. There's nothing to be forgiven, Fray Marcos, said the Viceroy. Take your time. I stared at Brother Luis, but no questions came his way. He had a blank expression. Several times he blinked in and out, and he looked like he hadn't slept in over a year. Coronado and the Viceroy took their turns, and the questions came in quick succession. Marcos answered every one. It's beyond there. Where, Marcos? Beyond there. Marcos pointed east. The Viceroy and Coronado looked at each other. How many miles? The distance, I mean, said Coronado. How far? It's hard to say, Governor. Draw it for us. Marcos' hands trembled. He drew points on black sheepskin and made a map. His eyes remained frantic. His tongue stuck out like a child's, and his mouth hung open. He drew mountains and flatlands. Then he drew what appeared to be an elk or a deer. Next, he drew a sun and a temple and circled them. And then he inserted more lines up and down. Finally, he drew several squiggly lines that represented rivers and streams. Coronado and Viceroy Mendoza stared up at the map 
and shared a baffled, incredulous look. How many cities did you see, Frey Marcos? Coronado asked. I saw all seven, Governor. All seven? All seven, Your Grace. These cities, what did they look like? They're wondrous. Like Rome? Grander than Rome. Describe them, please. They're far grander than Egypt, far wider than Rome. Grand and wondrous towers, gates as far as the eye can see. Temples, altars, barracks, all made of gold. As of God himself, I saw them all. The population, thousands, maybe tens of thousands. How far across? Over 130 miles. How far was the river? 60 miles. The viceroy asked Marcos more questions, all of which I had forgotten. The reason why was because I concentrated on Coronado's face. He looked to be completely in trance. While the question stopped, there was a long pause. All had stared. Some stared at each other. Some stared at the map. Brother Luis stared at the floor. Marco stared at the ceiling with his head tilted. I waited for the viceroy to say something else, but he said nothing. Then I waited for Coronado. Nothing still. Then the viceroy sighed, stood up, and bowed. Thank you, Friar Marcos, he said. Marcos exited through the door, and Brother Luis followed. The scribes and the other witnesses were the last to leave. As Marcos left the room, the viceroy and Coronado again shared a look of incredulity. They ignored me, but I stayed and stood and listened. He's going to be the most famous monk since Don Scotus, said Mendoza. We start tomorrow. We'll need translators, said Coronado. Done. Of course we'll need Diaz. Of course. Everybody needs a navy. And of course we'll need reconnaissance men. Yes. And cannons. Without question. Now you have your miracle, Coronado. But we still have to find it. We'll find them all, Viceroy. They peered at the golden cross which sat at the edge of the table. Coronado picked it up, held it in his hands and it glowed in the flame. So Marcos made me a general, said Coronado. No, I made you a general, said the viceroy. Marcos just made you believe again, as any clergyman should. We start tomorrow. The room turned silent. Then Coronado turned and looked at me. He was surprised I was still there. He tossed another pouch in my direction. I caught it and looked inside. It was all gold. It was five times larger than the one he gave to me. The viceroy stared. Coronado did not. I bowed and shook their hands. Then I left their company and headed towards my tent. Minutes turned to hours. I had one single thought. That of the dream. It had returned. It hurt me, the smile, but I did anyway for it wasn't until then that I knew for sure what Marcos had given us. It was a gift. It was a gift that killed many in the past, but it was also a gift that made many kings. It was a gift of divine hope. Another expedition. Another promise. A new adventure. Another dream. And for that one moment... I finally felt young again. <laughs>